Hi. Devendra. Hi. Now tell me, Anand. Uh, yes. You, I mean, okay. So what? Uh, when uh, people uh, ask questions, yeah, they are going mm -hmm. to. What's your usual uh, system? They uh, type something or they just raise their hand. Uh, they can ask in between also. Actually, in between also. Okay. Also, did they like? Uh, and somebody... Devendra is going to see that if somebody Devendra is going to see. Yes, huh? that... Devendra, you are going to see when somebody raises hands. Yeah. All right. That's Actually, at the end, of course, the one gives opportunity to the participants to ask. To ask. So, yeah. right. some are on the YouTube, so that. All right. So, are we all set? Right? How many people so far? They are coming. So, Devendra, when the meeting starts, you will put a video on oh, mute automatically. That. I don't think you can hear me. Devendra, can you hear me? Uh, we can't hear you. We can, we can hear you, but not well. Okay. Can you hear me better now? No, no. Uh, Nitsure, sir, you're fine. Uh, Devendra. Ah. Devendra, is... I can't hear him at all. Okay, my question was, you will put everybody on mute, right, Devendra? Hmm. All right, There's still three minutes. Let me switch on my power. Yeah, we start on time now. You want to wait? Yes, yes. we start on time because people are uh, seeing also on the YouTube. So, and they can click on also. So, and do we finish um, like one hour? So, there is a talk another uh, hour and a half afterwards, right? Yes. So so that's definitely a hard limit. Talk and then 5 30 another one. And the duration is one and a half hour max, right? Yes. Okay, all <laughs> but, right. You will finish your talk in about one hour, I suppose, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell me when to start and then put everybody on mute except Anand. After I introduce him, put me on mute also. I'll put myself on mute. Okay. Yeah, it is time to introduce. Yes. Okay. So we are happy to welcome our today's speaker, who is Anand Devkurkar from the Australian National University. And his title is Algebraic Curves and Bailey's Theorem. Uh, I hand over the mic to Anand. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nitsure. And thanks, uh, Devendra and the organizing team to organize such a nice program and to invite me to speak. I used to spend my weekends um, in high school at Bhaskaracharya. 
uh, doing like elementary mathematics, but we used to see people working through hard show and then you see symbols on the board. And, yeah. So it's very, uh, it's an honor to be back at Bhaskaracharya uh, to give a talk. So I'll share my screen. Um, uh, hopefully it'll... work. Uh, can you see yes, uh, yes. my writing? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'll try to look at the chat if somebody asks questions, but feel free to interrupt me and just ask uh, if there's something unclear. Okay, so, the, uh, so my goal today is to explain uh, a theorem called Bailey's theorem uh, and a sketch of a proof. What is this theorem about? I mean, it's, it stems uh, from this wonderful fact that we have a Riemann surface and we have two distinct ways of looking at a Riemann surface. So we can view it as a complex manifold, a compact complex manifold of dimension one, but we can also view it as a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers. So we have two kind of fundamentally distinct set of techniques to understand uh, the arithmetic and the geometry of, of Riemann surf surfaces. At the same time, we have the opportunity to ask questions from two different points of view. And some questions seem completely opaque from the other side. Okay? And one such question is the following. So the question that motivates uh, the theorem, the, the, the question that the theorem answers is the following. So given a smooth projective curve x over the complex numbers, okay? And uh, when can we define, when can x, can x be defined over a number field? And because X is a smooth projective variety, it's a variety of finite type. So its definition only involves finitely many coefficients. So saying it's defined over a number field, which is just a finite extension of Q is the same as saying that it's defined over Q bar. Okay? You never use all of Q bar. So I'll just state it like this. So the question is, uh, when can a, a, a Riemann surface a smooth projective curve over the complex numbers be defined uh, over a finite extension of Q or equivalently over the algebraic closure of Q. Now, this is a perfectly reasonable question to ask about an algebraic variety. I mean, it doesn't have to be a curve. You just give, give me any variety over C and it's reasonable to ask if it can be defined over a smaller subfield than C. Uh, but just from the point of view of complex geometry, this seems, you know, extremely mysterious. I mean, how do you know uh, some, anything about the field of definition from the complex structure or the topology basically? Um, and Bailey's theorem gives, so Bailey gives uh, kind of a complex analytic uh, characterization. And right slash topological uh, uh, let me before I move on, uh, let me say precisely what I mean by can X be defined over Q bar, okay? So uh, this means does there exist uh, 
a smooth projective variety, let's call it y over q bar, okay, um, such that x, the variety we start with, or which is over the complex numbers, is just obtained by base change. Okay, so uh, maybe I should write specs here, but I'll uh, try to save uh, writing and just write uh, base change like this, okay? Um, so that's what the question means. I mean, that this is the question in a more precise language. But kind of more concretely, what this means is that can you realize X uh, as, if you think of X as the set of points or the set of solutions of a system of polynomial equations, then being defined over Q bar just means that can X be, real, real, can X be realized as the zero set uh, of a system of equations uh, whose coefficients are algebraic. Okay. So we start with a smooth projective curve over C. So that means it can, by definition, be written as a zero set of uh, a set of complex equations, uh, equations with complex coefficients. But can you do it with uh, coefficients in Q bar? Okay, that's the same. That's the question. Right. So, so what's the statement? So the answer is this, this is the question. So this is the answer. Okay. And this is uh, known as Bailey's theorem. Um, the answer is that the following two th are equivalent. So the first is just this condition that uh, the first is X uh, over C, okay? Uh, so it's given, X is always going to be a smooth projective curve. I'll, I'll not write it over and over. So it can be defined over Q bar, okay? Yes. And secondly, this is the purely complex analytic slash topological characterization that there exists a, a finite map, a finite morphism, F from X to uh, P1, uh, P1C over the complex numbers, which is ramified only over three points. So let me write this way. So unramified, okay? So this is a finite map. So it has a, uh, it's a covering space almost everywhere. So there's a finite set of points in P1 over which it may have ramification but that set is as small as possible, basically. So this is unramified uh, on the complement of, let, let me just write zero, one, infinity. Okay. So it's kind of amazing. So if, if you can draw a picture like this with only, I don't know. This, so th these are all the ramification of this map happens over zero, one, and infinity. Okay. Uh, and I mean, I could have written any three points. Okay. So, so um, the, the choice of three points is, is uh, uh, unimportant. I mean, any three points are the same as any three points on P1 uh, up to a projective linear transformation. So I just chose zero and infinity. Okay. So um, that's the theorem. So number one is a completely arithmetic, completely algebraic uh, characterization of the same set of curves as number two. And number two is a purely complex analytic or topological characterization. Can it be written as a covering of P1 which is uh, et al, which is uh, a covering space away from three points on the uh, codomain. So these are equivalent. Um, 
So I'm going to prove both uh, directions. One implies two and two implies one. But before I uh, launch into the proof, uh, I want to discuss a bit about what two means. Okay, so suppose you have so, um, uh, somehow consequences of two uh, to uniformization. So imagine if you have, so imagine you have this picture, you have Riemann surface, right? Um, and it's expressed as a covering of uh, CP1 unramified outside of uh, three points, zero, one, infinity, okay? So if you puncture, so let's say U is the complement. So uh, this is supposed to be the subset sign and this is U and U is just the complement of P1 minus zero and infinity okay. and this was f so this is suppose i take the pre-image then this is a covering space okay. that's that's what unramified uh, a finite unramified morphism looks like in the complex analytic category it's a covering space yeah and now what's the universal cover of u i mean u is a uh, hyperbolic right so the universal cover um, of u is just the upper half plane, right? Um, and what's the fundamental group of u? Uh, that's just PSL two z. Okay, and uh, that's the three punctured uh, sphere. And uh, the the fundamental group acts on the universal cover by deck transformations, and this, this it's a standard action, right? So this action is by uh, fractional linear transformations. So it's here, the standard um, modular group acting on the upper half plane and the quotient is U. But now this X here, or more precisely the open subset of X, which is just X minus a bunch of uh, a finite set of points. Uh, let's call this X circ, okay? So X O, okay? It's an open subset, uh, a complement of finite many points on X. So X circ is so sitting, so this is the universal cover and X circ is a cover. So it sits like this uh, and this is finite, okay? So what you get is that the X zero, so if you take H and quotient out by the entire uh, modular group, PSL to Z, uh, PSL to Z, you'll get U, but if you quotient out to get X, you quotient out by a finite index subgroup. This is just uh, the usual correspondence between covers and subgroups. So this is uh, a finite index subgroup. So now this brings in some kind of group theory. I mean, so what uh, the theorem is saying that X uh, can be defined over Q bar, over uh, uh, algebraic numbers, algebraic, uh, an algebraic extension of Q, if and only if uh, X can be written as H mod T compactified, right? Um, this is given open subset uh, for G subset, uh, a subgroup of PSL to Z, uh, some finite index subgroup. So, I mean, if you're a complex geometer, how do you write down the set of all curves defined over Q bar, just complex analytically? Well, this is the answer. Just take H, the upper half plane, modulo uh, a finite index subgroup of the modular group. And there you go. You have all the curves uh, that can be defined, all the complex curve that, curves that can be defined over Q bar. Uh, quite stunning. Um, that you can have a characterization like this. Um, I won't dwell too much on this, but this is, uh, I think this, as an example, okay? So there are some uh, well-known subgroups of PSL to Z, like the modular groups, uh, matrices uh, that reduce to the identity modulo some fixed number N. That's a finite index subgroup. And the 
a quotient is a modular curve, right? Um, so the modular curves are defined over Q bar, um, but there are lots of other curves defined over Q bar, which are not modular curves. And correspondingly, there are lots of finite index subgroups of PSL to Z other than the congruent subgroups. Okay. Um, Right, so that's, so this is again, so this is just a restatement of Bailey's theorem. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, see, that's all I wanted to say before getting into the proof. Okay, so um, maybe I'll pause. In the rest of the time, I want to sketch a proof. Uh, Anand, can I ask yes? you a question? Yes. Uh, you say the, the, the fundamental group of U is free group on two generators, right? Oh, it should be, yes, yeah. Yes. Did I make so a what are you yeah. saying? You said yeah. something. I think I made a mistake somewhere. Um, yeah, it's not PSL to Z. Um, Yeah, this is a free group on two generators. Um, okay, you can fix up this part later. Okay. Yeah. Um, this. Wait, I no, I'm, uh, uh, no, no, I don't want to throw you off the more difficult part of it. It's, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so please return to this at the end if you have time left. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe I'm off by a finite index subgroup somewhere. Um, okay, so let's sketch proof. So what should we do? Should we do one implies two or two implies? So, so one is uh, uh, defined over Q bar. And this is ha having, being expressible. So this is called sometimes a Bailey map. Okay. okay. Um, let's do one implies two and then uh, do two implies one. Okay. Um, so let's do one implies two. All right. So what do we have? So we have X. Let's start with X over Q bar, okay. Um, a smooth projective curve. Um, and we want to produce a map from X to P1, which is unramified except over uh, three points. So there are going to be three steps. Um, so step one, we are just going to produce a map. Um, so X is a smooth projective curve over Q bar. So it has a map of uh, a finite map to P1 defined over Q bar. Okay. So just take one. There are lots of them. Okay. Let's just pick one. All right. Um, and uh, so this will have lots of ramification. I mean, we, we have no control over what this looks like. Um, some. What we're going to do is compose F with, uh, again, a finite map from P1 to P1. And this will be done in steps such that the composite here is has the desired property. Okay. 
So we are going to somehow take all the uh, branching that happens and concentrate it over three points by composing with a finite map from P1 to P1. Okay. Um, all right. So that's the strategy. So how do we do this? So uh, let me just introduce some notation. So this is uh, this is the stand. This is what. Uh, so if if I have f a finite map from x to p one, let's think over the complex numbers. Okay, um, then grid. F is just going to be the critical, the, the set of critical values okay, of F. This is just uh, the set of X in P1 such that F is ramified over X. Okay? So there's some point of the uh, set X, uh, let me say P. So the pre-image of P is, does not consist of distinct points uh, as many as the degree. Okay. okay. Uh, so our goal ultimately is to bring the critical locus of F to be in this three-point set. Okay. So that's what we are asserting. And uh, when we start, we don't know anything. So at the beginning, uh, we just have the critical locus of F. Well, this is a map over Q bar. So the, it'll just be a set of Q bar points. Okay. Um, this is horribly infinite, but that's all we know. It's a This is a finite set, but it's a finite set of algebraic points on P1. Okay. So that's what we know at the, after step one. Okay. Now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to arrange uh, so that the critical locus, uh, the critical set, the set of critical values is uh, not just in P1 Q bar, but in P1 Q. Okay. Um, so all the branch points are rational. All the critical values are rational, not just algebraic. Okay. And how do we do that? So this is not hard. Um, so this is how to do it. So let's say, um, Let's say S is the set of critical values. Okay. And let's divide S into S irrational and S rational. Okay. And what is R S? So S rational is just S intersection P1 Q. Okay. And S irrational is the complement. Okay, um, so there will be some rational points, some irrational points. There is the, the, these are still algebraic. Okay? Um, let's do one thing before we proceed. So let's uh, throw in all the Galois conjugates. Uh, so if we have one point in S, it's an algebraic uh, point. It's an algebraic, uh, um, it's a point of P1 Q bar. It has finitely many Galois conjugates. Let's throw them all in S, okay? So let's enlarge S uh, so that it's Galois invariant. And then it may not be equal to the set of critical points. It will just contain it, okay? Um, so S and make S Galois invariant, okay? So just add all the Galois conjugates. All right. And now it'll have some uh, irrational points and some rational points. Now look at this polynomial map. So look at P from 
P1 to P1, uh, okay. uh, which is defined by, so I'll define it on the standard A1. So it maps little x to the product of x minus s, where s ranges over the irrational points. Okay, first of all, if the set of irrational points is empty, then we are done. We don't want to, we're, we are already in P1Q. So let's say this is not empty. Okay. okay. So look, look at this polynomial. So let's call this uh, P of X. So what does P do? Uh, so P sends, it's a polynomial. So it sends uh, infinity to infinity. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And P sends uh, all of S to zero, right? Oh, sorry, all of S irrational to zero. Okay. And because uh, S is Galois invariant, S irrational is also Galois invariant. So this polynomial is actually a rational polynomial. So this polynomial Px is in uh, Qx. Okay. So this is, this is a map, but it's actually defined over the rational numbers. So it'll send the rational uh, set, S rational, to uh, P1Q. So it'll send rational points to rational points. And then where is P ramified? So what is the uh, ramification locus of P? So P is ramified. At well, it's ramified at infinity because it's a polynomial, right? Um, high order ramification, and it's ramified at the zero locus. I mean, where else? At the zeros of, of the uh, derivative, okay, that's where the derivative vanishes. Okay, so and what is this? This is a rational polynomial, so this is an element of Qx. Okay, of uh, degree one less than the degree of P. And so the degree of P is just the size of S irreducible. And this has a smaller size. So now if you look at the composite, so if you look at, uh, so, so you have this Riemann surface, uh, this is the set S, okay, over which it this is possibly branched. So S could be bigger. And suppose we compose this uh, original F with this P and look at this new map. What, where is this branch? So where is this ramified? So what's the critical locus of F? Oh, how do you compose? You take F first and then P. So what are the possible critical points of the composite? Well, all the points in the image of S, okay, um, they may be, so this F of S, okay. union um, infinity, okay, infinity may be critical. And what else? The zeros, the, the image of the zeros of P prime. So let's call this the set of zeros of P prime. Let's call this R. Okay. Union the set, uh, sorry, I did not mean S, I mean P, P, P here, P of R. Okay. So the critical locus of this uh, composite, it may not be as big, but it's contained in the union of these three sets. If you're outside of this, then the composite is unramified because P is unramified and F is unramified over the complement of this set, okay? So the critical locus of this composite is contained in this union. Well, what's P of S? By design, P sends uh, uh, S irreducible to zero and S rational to S uh, some set of rational points. So this is rational. Okay. Infinity is rational. And this is possibly irrational but it has uh, fewer elements than S irreducible. So this has size 
Uh, so this is smaller than S here. Okay. And now you induct. So just keep going. Um, uh, uh, Ananda question. Yeah. Yes. You will not enlarge it again by putting in Galva conjugates because they, those are already there. Oh, oh, oh. Great, great, great. Uh, you, you don't need to because this is already Galva invariant. Um, yes. Because this is a rational map. So I P, wanted you to make the comment. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, X, thank you. Okay. So, so S is a Galva invariant uh, by choice. And P is a rational map. Uh, so, P is actually a map that's defined on. Q, right? Um, that means that P of S is a uh, Galois invariant. P of inf infinity is Galois invariant uh, because it's rational. And R, the set R is Galois invariant because it's the set of zeros of a rational polynomial. Okay, so R is also Galois invariant. Okay? And that implies that P of R, because P is a rational. Uh, defined over Q, this is also Galois invariant. Okay, so this union uh, is already Galois invariant, so th that's great. Uh, then um, it really is smaller. We don't need to add anything bigger. Okay, so um, let's say S prime uh, is P of S union infinity uh, union P of R uh, is Galois invariant. And the size of the irrational, the, the size of the uh, irrational part of S prime is strictly less than the size of the irrational part of S. Okay. Um, so just uh, now replace your original map by this composite and keep going. Okay. Um, until S irrational is empty. And then you have uh, the critical locus contained in the set of rational points. Okay. Then um, eventually the rational point, will be rational, irrational part will be empty and you'll, you'll have this. So that's the uh, end of step two. So what we did, is we started with a possibly just any uh, map defined over Q bar and took a composite with a whole bunch of rational maps. And uh, the utility of doing that was now the uh, resulting map, this the critical set is rational. So, meaning it's contained in P1Q. Okay. Um, great. Uh, but we're not done. I mean, that this is not what uh, was asserted. Uh, oh, okay. Half an hour done, right? Okay. Um, so, this we need to go further. So, we need to. Um, Arrange so that P1 to so the critical set of F is just consists of three points. And I believe this is kind of magical. I mean, this is, so far we haven't done anything kind of uh, clever. I mean, this is what you would have done anyway. And this uh, if I started with a field other than Q, if you just start with the subfield of C, uh, so far everything goes through. I mean, you could have arranged so that uh, all the branch points are in the field of your choice. Okay. okay. Uh, but this has to use something specific about Q. I mean, you shouldn't be able to do this uh, in general. Okay. So, 
So the idea is again uh, uh, as before. Um, so how do we do this? So, so let's say S is the critical set, okay? So it's rational. And if S has fewer than three points, uh, three points or fewer, then we are done, okay? So assume it has at least three points, or let's say strictly bigger than three. Okay? And then make a fractional linear transformation. Uh, and let's say S contains zero, one, and infinity, and maybe it contains other garbage that we want to clean up, okay? Okay, so let's pick a point T uh, other than zero and infinity, which is in S. Okay? And now what can you do? So this is some rational point, okay? It's not infinity, so it's uh, on our A1. So it's some rational number. Um, so do the following. So, so send, I mean, apply, let's say x goes to one minus x and x goes to one over x a bunch of times. So this, both of these transformations, preser transformations preserve zero, one and infinity, I believe. Yeah. Um, and arrange so that, that the rational number t lies in the interval from zero to one. Okay. So zero less than t less than one. Okay. So you can do this. I mean, if t, is, uh, t starts out being too negative, right? Just apply this transformation, the first one, and then it will become positive. And suppose it goes beyond one, apply the second transformation, then it will come back to uh, something less than one. So you can assume that T is between zero and one. Okay. Um, okay, so let's write T as M over M plus N, okay? Where uh, these are numbers, I mean, uh, positive integers. Okay. And now this is the secret uh, ingredient. Uh, consider this polynomial. Uh, oh, by the way, there are many ways of doing what I'm doing. I mean, uh, arranging all the rational critical points to be in this set zero, one infinity. There are lots of clever tricks to do this. Uh, this is one, okay? Uh, I don't know if this was Bailey's original uh, trick, but there are many, okay? Um, so, so consider, but it's it's, a bit of cleverness. So consider this polynomial Q of X, which is X to the M times one minus X to the N. Okay, so M and N are uh, natural numbers. So this is a polynomial. And uh, I want it to be this time some constant, which I'll choose later, okay? So this is going to be some rational number. So where is it ramified? So, so, so Q defines a map from A1 to A1 and by uh, completing a map from P1 to P1, uh, where is this ramified? Okay, so it's ramified at infinity because it's a polynomial. So uh, it's ramified at infinity. It's ramified at zero because there's this M. I mean, it may be ramified, okay? So uh, possibly, but the ramification set is let's say contained in. And it's possibly ramified at one, okay, if n is higher than one. And then there is another point where uh, you differentiate this uh, with respect to x and set them equal to zero, okay. Um, and if you do that bit of algebra, you'll see that it's ramified at this point, so which is our t. Okay. So it's ramified at zero, one infinity, and this point t. Okay, so it's ramified here, zero, one, infinity, and this point T. And okay, so these are the critical uh, points, right? What are the crit critical values? So where does infinity go? It's a polynomial, so infinity goes to infinity, okay? Where does zero go? Well, zero goes to zero. Where does one go? One goes to one, okay? Sorry, one goes to zero, okay? Just plug in one, yeah? So that's great, okay? The critical uh, values 
are just infinity and zero so far. And I have this T, okay? And I'll just choose this constant in front so that T goes to one. I can do that. Okay. Um, So t goes, t goes to one. So this is a particular example of a Bailey map, right? It's 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 um, it's from p one to p one, okay. And its uh, ramification, its branch set is just zero one infinity, and its ramification set is zero one infinity, and this uh, extra point t, which is basically any rational number. Okay. Um, Okay, so what we do is, uh, thanks to this Q, we look at the original map F, okay. So this had branching over zero, one infinity and this point extra point T and possibly some other points. Okay. And now compose this with uh, our Q and look at the composite. So this is S here. So now where is the composite? Uh, what's the critical set of Q composed with F? Okay. I say that it's contained in okay, zero, one infinity. Those are always possibilities. Okay. And this point T here goes to one. Okay, so uh, we don't need to worry about that one. And then there are these remaining points, union um, Q applied to S minus zero one infinity T. So that's the critical set of the composite. Okay? It includes zero one infinity and it includes possibly some other points, but the remaining points are strictly less in number than um, the original set of extra points. So these are definitely fewer than, uh, I mean, fewer than or equal to. So it has size less than or equal to the size of S minus four, because we've deleted four points. Um, and induct. So with each step of this, we eat up one more critical point, shove it in zero one infinity, just, just we uh, move it to zero one infinity and we keep going. And so at the end, what we're left with is a belly map. Um, so it's going to be some huge degree, okay? I mean, we have no, and the, the form of this map is you take the original map and just, just compose with lots of uh, finite maps from P1 to P1. This was X. Okay. Um, so that's the end of the proof uh, of uh, the direction that, being uh, defined over Q bar implies that it's uh, it admits a belly map. Um, questions? Any comment about degree? Uh, how? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, No, I mean, um, do you have any comments? It's finite, uh, but I mean, at least if you follow my procedure, I mean, it depends hugely on like how complicated these complicated these rational numbers are, um, right? Because the map, I mean, so this is where it, it is crucially using that we are in uh, the field of rational numbers that like, when we constructed this Q, right? This, this heavily used that the field was such that 
we had like whole numbers. The, so the degree of Q is, I mean, depends on how big the numerator and the denominator of this rational number is. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, But I think, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, given a curve over Q bar asking, uh, you know, how efficiently it can be expressed uh, as a cover of P1 with just three critical points. And I think it's a question that you'll encounter in this series of talks, uh, but I don't want to get into that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, last 15 minutes, let me sketch the other direction. So two implies one. Yes, yeah, so what was two? Uh, two was somehow being, so having a Bailey map. So a Bailey map, uh, I, I, I keep saying this, well, these words, uh, a Bailey map is a map F uh, from X to P1C, which is unramified except outside of the set zero and infinity. Okay. And one was being defined over Q bar. Okay, so let me sketch how Y2 implies one. Okay. And sometimes this is called like the easy direction because it's um, this, this actually follows from, um, let me say, quote unquote, uh, general principles. Uh, there's no kind of uh, acrobatics. There's no clever step here. It's just if you know the general yoga of algebraic geometry, uh, this will be quite transparent. Okay? Uh, that's not to say that it's it's easy to a person who doesn't know. Uh, uh, the area, but um, in some sense, it, it follows from general results. Okay? Um, so let me at least explain those. So, and this direction was already known. So this, this was known before Bailey. So, um, um, okay, so let me sketch that. Uh, and let me actually do a slightly general uh, version. Um, okay, so suppose you have, sorry, let me make a, a definition. Okay, so suppose you have a, a divisor in P1. C, okay. divisor. Uh, let's say that this is, uh, and suppose we have a subfield K in C. Okay. Okay. So we say that D is K rational, okay, or uh, defined over K if. This is the vanishing set. If it's a divisor, uh, let's say this is effective. Okay? Uh, does it have to be, but let's say effective. Okay. So we say that D is K rational if this is the van, the, if it's the divisor of a homogeneous form FXY, okay? um, some homogeneous. So every divisor on P1 is the divisor of some homogeneous form. But we say that it's k-rational or defined over k if this form can be chosen to be in kxy, okay? If this can be chosen to have coefficients in the subfield, okay? Um, so a q-rational divisor uh, is a divisor on, on P1, which is the zero locus of a rational uh, form uh, into variables. Okay, so now suppose you have, uh, let's say X over K. So K is some field, okay? Um, 
you can assume subfield of the complex numbers. Let's say this is a smooth projective curve. Okay. And suppose you have a finite map from X to P1 over K defined over the field K. Okay. So the X is defined over K, P1 is defined over every field and the map is defined over K okay. and the map is finite. We've been looking at the set of critical values of F. Okay, uh, so this is just, uh, we can upgrade that set to a divisor. So we can associate to F a, an effective divisor on P1 uh, called the branch divisor. Um, and the, the set of points underlying the branch divisor is just the set of critical values. Okay? But it has, it comes with some extra data. It comes with uh, multiplicities. Okay? And the key point is that uh, the, the divisor is defined over the field over which the curve X and the map is defined. Okay? So this can be described as the zero locus of some form constructed out of this map called the discriminant, uh, but let's not go into that, okay? This is just, a, there's a procedure that given a branched cover uh, associates to it an effective divisor called the branch divisor. And the cover is unbranched. So this X to P1, okay. Uh, if you look at P1 minus the branch divisor and look at the pre-image, uh, a product, right? So this this is unramified. So this is eta. Okay. Uh, uh, what else should I say? So uh, what's the degree of this divisor? If this is genus G, okay, and if this map has degree D, then this branch divisor has degree two G plus two D minus two. Okay. Okay. So what's the theorem? So the theorem is that, uh, suppose you have F from X to P1C, such that the branch divisor of F, so this is a divisor on P1, suppose it's K rational. So K is a subfield of C, okay? Then this means uh, then, So X and F can be defined um, over not the field K itself, but over a finite extension. Okay. And this implies the corollary. So as a corollary, uh, if you know that the branch divisor of F is supported on, let's say zero, one infinity, okay, then any divisor supported on this, this is a set of rational points. So any divisor supported on this is a Q rational divisor. Okay? And that implies that the Riemann surface X, okay, and the map F, but maybe we don't care so much about the map, uh, implies that X is, can be defined over a finite extension of Q, so definitely over Q bar. So this was the second part of Bailey's theorem. Um, as I said, this is quite general, this two implies one, and it's not specific to rational numbers. Uh, it's, it's a fact about, any fields. Uh, okay, so why is the theorem true? Um, I was going to sketch two proofs, but maybe I don't have. Let's, let's see how much patience we have. Okay, so here's a sketch, um, the proof of the theorem. 
this is how I think about the proof, okay? This is a proof. Um, so the key idea is that the, uh, the uh, set of finite coverings of the projective, of, of the projective line, this forms a moduli space. So um, what do I mean? So, so if you look at the set F from X to P1, okay, so X is a smooth projective curve of genus G, let's say, okay, and F is a map, a finite map of degree D. Okay. Um, I'm keeping the field, uh, uh, suppressing the field, but you could do this over a chosen field. Okay? And if you look at all such maps up to isomorphism, so what does up to isomorphism mean? Suppose I have X1 mapping to P1 and X2 mapping to P1. I say that these two F1 and F2 are isomorphic if there is an isomorphism between X1 and X2, that makes this diagram complete. Okay. So let me state, uh, let me make a statement. Okay. And uh, let me use red here. I'm making a false statement. Okay. So this is false, but it's uh, close enough that it's worth making it. So I, I want to clarify what I mean by the set of finite covers of P1 uh, up to isomorphism forms a moduli space. The statement I want to make is that there is a scheme of a finite type over Q uh, let's call it H D, G, okay. Uh, and a natural isomorphism between on one hand, K points of the scheme and isomorphism classes of finite covers defined over K uh, on the other side. So what this is saying is that there is a scheme HDG whose K points correspond exactly to genus G curves defined over K and degree D maps to P1 defined over K. Okay. This is not true. I mean, th th there is no such scheme, okay. but this is close enough that uh, I'm going to sketch a proof and then make corrections. Okay. Let's assume for the moment that this is true. Okay, great. Um, now uh, there's also, now this is a true proposition. Uh, okay. uh, that there is a moduli space of degree D divisors on P1. So there is a scheme. Okay, a finite type, I'm, you're going to laugh at this uh, over Q. Uh, let's say B, this number B is the number of branch points, 2G plus 2D minus two. Okay. Finite type over Q, uh, let's call, the, call it PB. Okay. And a natural isomorphism between K points of PB and uh, degree B divisors on P1K. Okay. So divisors on P1 defined over K of degree B. And uh, the second proposition is almost obvious. I mean, I can, I, I'll tell you what PB is. PB is just the projective space of PB. Uh, I mean, more precisely, if you look at, let's say V is the uh, vector space 
of degree B forms uh, over Q in two variables, X and Y. Okay. So, I mean, remember, what's a degree B divisor on P1K? It's given by an element of uh, KXY, homogeneous polynomial in X and Y over K, non-zero, up to scaling. Okay. So then PB is just the projectivization of this vector space. So this is just saying that, so uh, yeah. Um, um, so that's why this proposition is true. It's just a projective space. Okay. So you have one modular space, this HDG, defined over Q, finite type defined over Q, and this other space PB. So this parameterizes finite covers. Okay. Uh, so this points of this are, look like this up to isomorphism and points of these are divisors and i told you that there is a procedure uh, that constructs given a cover uh, a divisor which is its branch divisor okay. so the uh, construction that i did not explain gives not just a map of points but a map of schemes from hdg to pb this sends this to this branch divisor so this map, it's defined over Q, okay? uh, that maps a cover to its branch divisor. Let's call this map PR, okay? because that's what it does. And uh, the key proposition is that this map PR is quasi-finite, meaning it has finite fibers. Let's say finite geometric fibers. And why is that? I mean, if you want to check, so how do you check that BR is quasi-finite? Uh, so it's enough to check on C points. Okay. So what's a C, so given a C point of PB, so that's uh, given a degree B divisor on P1C, okay, that's what a C1 point of PB looks like. We want to look at okay how many C one point C points of HDG are such that their branch divisor is this. Okay, so given a particular divisor B in P one C, my claim is that there exists only finitely many uh, degree D covers x to p1 with branch divisor equal to b. And um, now let's use a complex analysis topology. So, so why is this true? I mean, this if you go to u, which is p1 minus b, right? So this is a covering space. The restriction of f gives you a covering space. And this covering space is determined by homomorph its monodromy, which is a homomorphism from the fundamental group of U to the symmetric group on D letters. So this is a map of degree D, right? And this group is finitely generated. It's finitely many generators and relations. And this group is finite, just symmetric group. So there are finitely many homomorphisms like this. So there are finitely many possible monodromy uh, data. So there are finitely many coverings of U, and therefore there are finitely many coverings of P1, which are unbranched, uh, which are et al on the complement of P. Okay, so in particular, there are finitely many uh, whose branch divisor is precisely B. Okay. So that's why this map is quasi-finite. You just go to the complex numbers and use topology. But what that means is that now, so if you, so this, you have this map. And then one, one question. Yeah. You'll, you will also have to use something like Riemann mapping theorem. I mean, to fill the removable singularities, right? Uh, well, Not I mean. Not just topology, but some complex analysis. <laughs> uh, well, not, if, if you just want to show that there are finitely many, okay? I'm not even asserting that any monodromy representation gives you a cover. It does, but 
uh, you want to say that if the two have the same monotone representation, even after putting in those points, they are isomorphic. So let oh, this yes, yes, yes. Is it yes, 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 oh, absolutely, yes, um, yes. Um, that's correct. Yes, right. You're absolutely right. Um, so if two, uh, if x zero and x prime zero are isomorphic then the isomorphism extends to give an isomorphism of x and x prime. Yes. So not just topology, some complex analysis, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so this map has finite fibers. So now if I give you a, a, a K point of this, so so given. Uh, what did we want to prove? So we wanted to prove that uh, if f from x to p one c has branch divisor f defined over k. Okay, so this is what we know. So the branch divisor f, so this corresponds to a point a C point of PV, okay? But if this is defined over K, then we are saying that this C points actually comes from a K point of PV, right? So this is the branch divisor of F. And this F uh, is in the fiber by definition uh, of this K point. So this F from X to P1 uh, represents a C point of uh, this fiber product HDG cross PB over K. I expect K, let's write that. Okay. Um, where the, this, this map, spec K to PB, is just this K point of PB given by this branch divisor. And what do we know about this scheme? Well, uh, this is a finite, so this is a scheme over spec K, right? But this is finite, uh, meaning this uh, HTG over PV spec K is just spec of some algebra A, where A is a finite length k algebra. I mean, all quasi finite. So finite type, finite type and quasi finite schemes over spec k, those are just uh, spec of a finite type k algebra, right? And what we have is a, a C point of A. So spec A, sorry, we have a C point of this. So we have a homomorphism from A to C. This has to, the, uh, so because of this, uh, this A is finite length, right? Uh, this, the kernel of this homomorphism. So this it corresponds to this F point. So this C point, okay. So the kernel is a maximal ideal. Uh, I mean, a priori, it, so this is where we are using that it's finite length, okay? A priori, uh, the kernel of uh, a map is only a prime ideal, okay? Um, but all prime ideals of A are maximal because it's a finite length, right? So the kernel is a maximal ideal. So the map factors through A mod M, uh, so that's M to C, okay? And so this is a K algebra, right? so this is a K algebra. And now null Stalin's art, so let's call this L, right? Uh, implies that K to L is a finite extension, finite field extension. And then we're done because uh, this C point, so this corresponded to this point F X to P1, we just showed that it actually comes from an L point where L is a finite extension of K. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so that's the proof uh, of two implies one, except that uh, I used a false statement. So, <laughs> so okay, so let me in like, okay, I'm already over time, but in the last four minutes, let's say, let's correct the false statement. Okay. Uh, how do we fix the falsehood? Um, well, uh, there are two possible things to do, uh, which is all standard for people who work in uh, the area of moduli spaces. Um, one is uh, to correct the statement. So the, the, the statement, the proposition is indeed true. Um, if instead of insisting that we have a scheme, uh, we allow ourselves a bit more freedom. Um, so what I said here, here, that there's a scheme of finite type over Q. Well, this is not quite true, but there is a uh, Dillian Mumford stack of uh, finite type over Q called HTG and a natural isomorphism. Uh, well, you can say something stronger than just a natural So you have to fix this also, okay? Um, but it is indeed true that K points of the stack correspond to uh, uh, curves defined over K and maps to P1 defined over K. Okay? So it doesn't characterize it, but it's true. Okay? So, uh, and the rest of the proof is almost the same. Um, you hardly need to change anything. Um, you can also fix it in another way by uh, using a, a notion, a weaker notion of moduli space, which is called a coarse moduli space. Okay. And then you can keep scheme as it is. Okay. Um, so it's true that there is a scheme of finite type over Q, call it HTG, and a natural isomorphism like this, but it's only true for K algebraically closed, okay? So in this statement, in the second way of fixing things, this is the statement holds if K is algebraically closed. Okay. So in general, it's not true that points of the coarse moduli space represent actual objects. So K points of uh, HDG, uh, the coarse moduli space do not represent uh, necessarily finite covers of P1 defined over K, but they do if K is algebraically closed. Okay. But that's all we needed. So just use, uh, so what we get even in this route is that we do get F from X to P1 defined over K bar, okay, which is all we wanted. We wanted something over a finite extension but if something's defined over K bar, it's defined over a finite extension, okay? Um, okay, um, I think that's where I should stop. Uh, there's actually, I mean, you can, if you don't want to rely on the existence of this moduli space, it's not that hard to give like an honest proof. Um, and while I was preparing this stuff, I wrote it down in, as notes to myself, uh, I can send it to Devendra if I, uh, if that helps. Um, but you can give an honest proof with the details uh, without assuming the existence of a moduli space. At certain points, you'll, you'll uh, need statements which uh, kind of go in the direction of proving that there exists a moduli space. Um, but I thought this was a more conceptual argument, so. Okay, um, I think Thanks, that's Anna. where I want to stop. Okay.
Thank you, Anand. Now time for questions. So the relation with the triangle groups that it is the cover yeah. Let me. I kind of botched that, right? So uh, yeah, what is it? Um, so these covers are the can be obtained as a finite index subgroup as uniformized by from the upper half plane. Yeah. So is it uh, straightforward or it also requires something non-trivial? I think it was not by Bailey. It came later, right? Yeah, I think it was later. So I don't know how. I can't think on so the spot. We can not have. We do not have time also actually. Yeah, I don't have anyone time. Has I guess. Has question, yeah, if anyone can... knows, um, they should tell me. Okay, Anand, just a quick comment. Perhaps you didn't have time to make it. Those yeah. uh, things in H D G had automorphisms. That was your problem, yeah. Yes. Some groups of varying sizes. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Are there any more questions? We have now almost run out of time. We can allow a last quick question if there's any. Yeah. 